To say that Jay Cardi is an unusual communicator is a mild statement. Maybe a little nuts would be more accurate. Not a preacher, not a teacher, more a storyteller with a very important message. Where some deep preachers are too snoozy for the rank and file, and where some humorists don't have much to say, Jay's stuff is generally regarded as an unusual blending of humor and profound content. A former Oregon State basketball star and L.A. Laker, Jay has dedicated his life to helping people say yes to God. Now, we hope you enjoy Cardi's contemporary classics. Two things in life will take mastery over you like few things will. First one is food. It's ugly, isn't it? Broke my leg a few years ago, gained 14 pounds. Took 12 of them off, took three months to do it, and the fourth month I put 14 of them back on. <laughs> half of them are on that side. Other half over there. Now, it's not quite sin yet. <laughs> Is food tough for you? The Bible spends a verse and a half on it, spends six and a half verses on sex. In other words, you think food's tough compared to sex? Piece of cake. All right, now... Verse 18, right after flea immorality. Every other sin that a man or a woman commits is outside the body, but the immoral person sins against their own body. It's the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. You've been bought with the life of Christ. Don't, you've got to glorify your body. Every other sin's external. Only sexual sin is... Sexual sin is different. You said, hold it, Jay. On Sunday, you told us all sin's the same. Saying no to God. Consequences, heaven or hell, long term. That's true. But there are short-term consequences. And Christian, you need to know you will never be punished by God. But you will be disciplined according to the depth of your calling, how long you've known the Lord, and the kind of sin you commit. And the biggie is sexual sin. Why? I don't know for sure. We're made in his image. That's not a shape. He makes choices. We make choices in his image. He has personality. We have personality in his image. I know he has a sense of humor. Look at the person on your right and try not to laugh. <laughs> Can't do it. It's funny, isn't it? Better laughs on your left. Oh, funniest one of all. Just look right behind you. That's really a panic. Yeah. All right. God has a sense of humor. Here's one. Did God create? I have two. My wife and I, we made two kids. You know how long they're going to last? How long will their souls last? Not even the angels get to do that. Just us. And there's something about the sanctity of that place where you make an eternal soul that's really a big deal to God. Really a big deal to God. See, those of you who are still virgins, do not save yourself for your mate. Not a good reason. Your wedding night will probably be a disaster. It just will be. You know, all the hype on that whole thing and the whole deal, and you need a little practice, and it's really fun to practice, but you'll need a little practice. And what you do is you save yourself for God. Because it's God who wants to bless you. And there's some very good reasons, too. One, see, you'll always take comparisons into your marriage. And there'll be mind scars, and you'll have memories, flashbacks at the most inopportune time. And if you couldn't be trusted before marriage, how can you be expected to be trusted after marriage? So you take mistrust into the relationship. And you, understand, you need to understand the reason God gave us sex in the first place. It was to so bond us with our mate in such a deep and powerful way that we would have the mechanism in place to get us through those difficult times that life has to offer. But if you've been real promiscuous along the way, you lost the meaning of it. You lost the meaning of the bonding. It just became a physical act of pleasure, a sedative to help put you to sleep at night. It, it lost the reason. If you got raped back when, if you're a product of sexual abuse, one of two things might have happened. You might have lost its meaning and thought love was always demonstrated through sexual intercourse, physical pleasure, and so you lost its meaning, or, or you're afraid to participate in it the way God intended. You've been scarred some, and you need to work that through. 
So there are a lot of real good reasons besides just God wanting to keep you from getting hit by a car. Because, folks, when you go play in the traffic, you will get hit by a car. And some, that always leaves a scar. And some people say, well, I've been hit by a car once. I might as well go get hit again. And they do not realize God's forgiveness is bottomless. There are always consequences to sin. You're forgiven for your sin, you endure the consequence, and that's the way it is. Something about the importance of the virgin birth here. Jesus had to be born of a virgin. If he's not, he ends up an onion. See, if he has a physical father, the sins of the father visit upon the children. The Puritan says, oh, that's the act of intercourse. Now we've got to make that ugly and awful. And they missed out on a lot of fun because God did not intend that. What he said was the sin nature gets transmitted through the male. Sins of the father visit upon the children. Adam's sin has ultimately been visited upon you. And if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, he wouldn't have qualified to die for his own sin, let alone ours. And so with the Holy Spirit as his father, he qualifies as a sinless lamb. See, it's real important. It's a real important act. And virginity is a real big deal. It's a real statement to God. Let me prove to you he hates it. Turn to Luke 17. Luke 17. This is the day of the great to-do. Do you know what to-do is? Ever been in your bathroom? No tissue? All you have is a little cardboard cylinder? How many of you ever gone and gone? Do-do! <laughs> How many used it for a spyglass? Sailing, sailing. Just before the Lord returns, there's going to be a shout in the heavens. Ah! Be a great trumpet blast. To do. Just before that happens, verse 26, Luke 17, it'll be the way it was in the days of Noah. And how was it? Verse 27, eating, drinking, buying, selling, planning, building, carrying on business as usual. Except that uh, Jude tells us they were only carrying on evil continually. I'm sorry, Genesis tells us that. In verse 28, it was happened the day, same as happened in the days of Lot. Where did he live? Sodom and Gomorrah. What was going on there? Eating, drinking, buying, selling, planning, building. Carrying on business as usual, except Jude tells us, chasing after strange flesh involved in gross immorality. And how was it there? Remember when the angels came to rescue Lot and there was so much homosexuality that the men wanted to rape the angels, you recall? And so God destroyed the place by fire except for one family, Lot's family. What was the final straw before he did that? Gross immorality typified by rampant homosexuality. And then he destroyed the whole place by water in the days of Noah, except for one family, Noah's family. So what were the keys then before he did that? Gross immorality typified by rampant homosexuality. And he's going to do the same thing in these last days, except for one family, his church. And what's going to be the key? Gross immorality typified by rampant homosexuality. And I think we're all set. See, we got our got Sodom in Vegas, our Gomorrah in San Francisco, and we're all set. And there's only one place where God destroyed so utterly and completely. In the Old Testament, it was for idol worship. You know what he called it? Spiritual adultery. Sexual sin is the standard by which the disciplines of God are meted out for all the rest of sin. It is a big deal to God. Your sexuality is a lot like a locomotive. Not a, not a diesel. That's got multiple driving wheels. This is a steam engine. One engine turn, one wheel turns. And engineers used to have a lot of fun. They tuck a penny under the wheel. So when the wheel turned, couldn't get a bite. It'd just sit there and spin against the penny until it eroded it. And they'd laugh. <laughs> Like a little block of wood under a wheel of a 747. Can't get rolling. But you move the penny two inches, what happens to the penny? Gets flat. Put a car in the road a mile down the track, what happens to the car? 
gets flat. Put a house in the road three miles down. What happens to the house? Gets a hole in it. All right, so you understand that your sexuality is a lot like a locomotive because once you've moved the penny, if you're a young person dating, there are only two things that will stop the runaway locomotive of your sexuality. Only two things. Policeman's flashlight, your parents coming home. That's it. <laughs> Nothing else. So it's important. See, nothing makes any sense in the back seat of a car. Nothing makes any sense once you've moved the penny. You'll risk your relationship with your wife. You'll destroy your ministry. You'll give your kids a reason to go do what you've just done because nothing makes any sense once you've pulled the penny. You got to keep the penny tucked under the wheel. You, you, you got to. Let's do the seduction. Go to 2 Samuel 13. You know how to get there? I think of a generator, exit sign, or Levi's numbers coming through the cuff, going through the word dot, D-O-T, dotaronomy. Two faces joshing each other in the backside, and a judge is here. He's talking to a lady. You know her name, Babe Ruth Candy Bars, coming out of her mouth. <laughs> She's sitting in a chair, and the front two legs are two Uncle Sam's pointing, I want you, and you want the second Uncle Sam. Just to finish, two king crown, back of the legs, two guys with chronic coughs, coughing E's and Z's. <laughs> Over the ester eggs that are doing the jobs, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now the big egg at the end is wearing a football helmet, he's the proverb. <laughs> he's got a triple elastic coming out of his mouth, a cleese elastic. A musical note on it, a cold blue shivering ICAA. Hooked in the back of anybody's pants named Jerry, wearing a miner's hat. Jerry Miner. He's got a lamb under this arm and a sickle in this hand. A sickle, a sick eel. And a lion's den. And a hose coming out the back. Sporting black, black letter J's, not oil, be Joel. Making a mess under a round bed with eyeballs all over it. I, an Obadiah. With a whale. Talking into a microphone. Shaped like a horse's head, neighing hams. Neighing hams. You have to go see that. <laughs> Wearing a nun's habit with K's all over it. Habit, cut, 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 cut. <laughs> Held up by Zeppelin with eyeballs down the side. Zeppelin eye. Some old hags inside. And... Uh, <laughs> They're trying to sock each other's eye, you know, sock around. With mallets right in the eye. That's the way I do it. You, you don't have to do it that way. But we're at 2 Samuel 13. You've had plenty of time. <laughs> Tomorrow is David's son. I'm sorry, David's, <laughs> David's daughter. And Amnon was her half-brother. And he wanted her. She was a virgin. She was gorgeous. She was stunning. And Amnon had sexual fantasy for Tamar every day to the point he made himself ill. Verse 2. We get a current. Ask your boyfriend over. Folks are gone. Watch a little TV. A little kissy face. A little huggy bod. No big deal. Until the guy says, standard line for a guy. Pull on your cover, guys. Don't stop me now. Don't stop me now. You can't stop me now, we've gone too far. Because if you stop me now, it's gonna hurt me. <laughs> we have to go all the way, all right? Now while she's thinking about that, the headlights flash through the living room window as they turn in the driveway home unexpectedly early. Here's my question. Could the guy stop or not? <laughs> it's one of the things that will get the thing stopped. All right. And I want the girl to know, won't hurt him. <laughs> little twinge here, maybe. That's it. Nothing worse than that. Tell him, go home, take a shower. I might have a ooh right there, but it's no big deal. You get out of here. <laughs> and if you got a friend named Jonadab, look out. 
Because he says, pretend to be sick, have David send you tomorrow over and make some hotcakes for you. Now, David's really an out-to-lunch dad. You don't smell a rat in that deal. You're not very close to your kids. And I'm not kidding about the hotcakes. Look at verse 8. She took the dough and kneaded the dough and baked the cakes in the side. Hotcakes. <laughs> verse 9. Oh, the banging and clanging of the servants. Oh, such a headache. Dismiss them tomorrow. Yes, tell them to go. No, you stay, okay? <laughs> Why'd she stay? I submit to you in junior high, your self-image got beat up. And now when somebody makes you feel desirable, nobody wants to leave that too soon. You get a little goosebump, goes right up and down, a little zing, zong, zing, and nobody wants to leave. She does not intend to go to bed with him, but it feels good to feel desirable. Besides, he's got a great view of the city and a few CDs she hadn't heard. <laughs> Verse 10. Oh, it's the Hong Kong flu. So sick, I don't even have the strength to bring my hand to my mouth. Tomorrow, bring the hotcakes into the bedroom and feed me till my strength is restored. <laughs> now, why'd she do it? Listen, if, you call, if he called her up and said, Tamar, come on over and go to bed with me, she would say, what are you talking about? Get out of town. But after two compromises in the bedroom, he's in bed, they're alone. See, it's compromise that's a killer, and you don't want to ever take the first $5. See, the first $5 is the first time you cheated on a test in school. It's the first time you lifted a pack of gum from 7-Eleven. It's the first time you cheated on your income tax. It's the first time you crossed the line of propriety. It's the first $5. Usually give that back without a consequence. But zeros are nothing. You understand zeros are nothing? But they sure make something out of a five. And then it gets real tough to give it back. And the second zero is just so easy to do. And then you can string six of them and go to jail real easy. Like some folks have. So don't take the first five, like Scott. Scott was a starting quarterback for his high school football team. And three upperclassmen linemen invited him out. And what an honor. And so he's in the car, and the guy pulls out a six-pack of beer and passes around the beer. And Scott hadn't had a beer yet. And uh, if they called him and said, hey, Scott, let's go drink some beer. He said, sorry, guys, got to study. See you tomorrow at practice. But he's in the car. He doesn't want to be a wimp with his linemen. These are the guys who keep him from getting killed. My folks won't know. I'll just do it once. No, okay, I'll, just, I'll do it. And he takes five bucks. Guy pulls out a little bottle of red pills. He never had uppers. Reds aren't anything he'd ever done. If they called him up and said, hey, Scott, let's drink some beer, take some drugs, what do you say? Sorry, guys, got to study. See you tomorrow at practice. No thanks. But he's in the car. He's already taken five, zeros to nothing. Didn't have to think about it much. Guy next to him pulls out a joint, tokes up. God never smoked weed before. But they called him up and say, Scott, take, let's go drink some beer, take some drugs, smoke some weed. Hey, what do you say? Sorry, guys, I don't do that. I'll see you tomorrow at practice. Uh, hmm. But the second zero was, didn't even have to think about it. Didn't even have to think about it. They're cruising along the Lover's Lane area, one lone car. Guy shuts off the lights, turns off the engine, coasts up behind the car and says, this will be fun. Everybody jumps out of the car, but whew, things are moving for Scott. <laughs> the three football players go over and bounce the car. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. That's pretty funny. <laughs> The guy jumps out and runs back, and first football player hit him. Held him up for the second football player. Both of them held the unconscious man up and put out one of his eyes. Dropped him to the ground. Girl was frightened. Kind of a turn on for him because they were kind of high. They put a paper bag overhead. Sure, why not? And they raped her. And they said, Hey, Scott! Your turn. If you call Scott and say, hey, Scott, let's go drink some beer, take some drugs, smoke some weed, rape a girl. What do you say? It's absurd. Except we're capable of such atrocity. And she was passive and she was whimpering and all of a sudden she became violent. It's a true story, Midwest newspaper. Their eyes met. Scott had just raped his sister. I want you to think about that for a second. It's tragic. It's violent. 
it's true. Scott went before his Heavenly Father and with repentant heart, truly repentant heart, begged forgiveness. Would he be forgiven? Yes or no? That's wild. Take David's sin, put it in contemporary terms, add murder to it. That's wild. Oh, let me ask you this question. What do you think breakfast was like in that household? Folks, don't you understand? God's forgiveness is bottomless. It doesn't fix the consequences. Read on. Verse 11. Come lie with me, my sister, he says. He's not messing around. He grabs her by the wrist. She says, no, don't do this terrible thing. And that's where our story begins. Verse 15. Then Amnon hated her with very great hatred and was greater than the lust with which he had lusted after. He said, get up, go away, get out of my sight. I hate your guts. What had happened? High school girl puts out for the guy. Can be the other way around. Proverbs talks about the seduct dress. Because she thinks she loves him. And, and high school people, I'm not being naughty now. You just don't have a clue. You do not know the difference between lust and love. It takes a little while to learn that. And so she puts out to seal the relationship. And then something happens. And for some reason, after a few times, he dumps her. Why, why would he do that? He thought he loved me. And now she's got to face him and his buddies who all know her intimate secrets and a lot of them don't. 40% of teenage suicide in females is sexually related. But if you're here and you had premarital sex, and you got married, and divorce isn't a part of your vocabulary, but you noticed last night when I asked you, does your husband speak to you in harsh, embittered tones? If you had premarital sex, you probably don't look, have to look any further for the source of the bitterness that's there. Had an associate pastor of a church come up to me after this session, and he said, Jay, I was in seminary, engaged, we're going to be married, and we just decided, under God's eyes, we are anyhow, and we had sex. And I went home last night, and I did what you told me to do, and what I'm going to tell you to do tonight, if that's you. And I unashamedly, unashamedly am trying to sell red books. I want to go home with you. Because in the back of that book, is a, in the glossary, is a prayer, a warfare prayer. It's for couples who couple too soon. And you're going to go home, and if during prayer tonight you both squeeze each other, that means you're going to go home, and you're going to look into each other's eyes, and you're going to say, I am so sorry I led you into sin. And the other one is going to say, I am so sorry I went into sin with you. Will you forgive me? Yes. Will you forgive me? Yes. Confess that before God, each other, work through the warfare prayer and scrape off the leech, and watch the bitterness disappear from your relationship. This associate pastor did that. He went home, he said, I confess to my wife. And she looked at me and she said, I have been angry with you for 15 years. For 15 years, representing God, having done that to me, I've been angry with you for 15 years. And they got it right. And you need to get it right. Because this, in this day and age, virgins, when they get married, are like unicorns, mermaids, and other mythical creatures, there aren't many of them. I have the permission of my daughter to say that both her and her husband were 27 years old. They were both virgins, and they don't know another one like them. They're scared. We hope that you enjoyed this week's installment of Cardi's Contemporary Classics. We'll join Jay next week for a continuation of his laugh-inducing and thought-provoking insights. Until then, you can catch up on Jay's and many other encouraging and instructive podcasts at the E-Squared Media Network at www.e2medianetwork.com.